Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the Hot Tech Webinar Series. This is your host, Eric Cavanaugh. I'm very pleased to be with Jeff Bainton today of Simba Technologies. That's part of Magnitude Software for a Techopedia webinar. Big thanks to all of you for your time and attention. Big thanks to our friends at Techopedia for hosting this Hot Tech webinar, which is all about digital transformation. So the exact title is Data Driven, Achieving Digital Transformation Efficiently. And I'm joking here, don't wait for the movie because it's coming and it's coming fast and it's coming right now. So really, digital transformation is about one thing. It's a one-word answer if you get right down to it, and that's called automation. It's really an operational function. You're automating traditionally manual processes. But in order to do that correctly, in order to do it efficiently, what do you need? You need data, and not just any data. You need good, clean, solid data. So here's an interesting concept that came up with a few years ago, the square root of truth. What is the square root of truth? It's an interesting thought to ponder, and my opinion is that it's really a couple different things. It's a commitment to process. So if you think about science, for example, science is a methodology underpinned by a practice called the scientific method, right? It's really a discipline underpinned by that methodology. And that methodology has some pretty strict rules around it. You need reproducibility. You need to be able to reproduce what you've done. Uh, it really requires you to focus on a process and to have a commitment to finding the answers, right? So I say the square root of truth is really a process coupled with a commitment. Now, if you talk about data, let's talk about data warehousing, for example, because even though digital transformation is operational in nature, it must be fueled by data. So where do you get that data from? Well, a lot of times you can get it from operational systems, but really if you're in a larger organization or even a mid-sized organization, you're gonna to wanna to have some kind of a data strategy or an information strategy because data drives all operations, but it also drives analysis. So really what you want your digital transformation to focus on is the analytical side. You wanna be embedding the value gleaned from insights into your operations. Well, how do you get there? Typically data warehousing is what we've done over the years, but now in the last couple of years, we've had this tremendous focus on artificial intelligence. Well, it's not the first time. So there have actually been a couple of AI winters, as they're called. Those are when uh, the industry goes into the trough of disillusionment, as Gartner refers to it. And that's because there was a whole lot of promise. There was a lot of expectation. There was a lot of money invested. And then it all kind of fell flat. Well, that's not going to happen this time. I can tell you, folks, third time's a charm. I think there have been two AI winters to speak of over the last 30 or 40 years or so. And I don't think that's going to happen this time for a whole bunch of different reasons, one of which is because we have the computational power now with the cloud. We have enough resource available to crunch the numbers and to get that stuff done. Because artificial intelligence, really, when you get down to it, has a whole lot to do with parallel processing. And it has a lot to do, of course, with models, with uh, appropriate architectures, and then the ability to map that back into operational systems. So I recently gave a presentation about data warehousing versus artificial intelligence. That's where this particular slide comes from. And here's just some interesting things to keep in mind. So data warehousing is really deterministic. If you want to know exactly how many widgets were sold, what the, the exact number is, you're going to be looking to data warehousing for that number. You're not going to be looking to artificial intelligence, by and large. A good buddy of mine, Dr. Jeffrey Malofsky, he is the data scientist for our company, the Bloor Group. And he made this determination that deterministic is data warehousing, stochastic is really for exploratory purposes, and that's where AI is very, very useful. So with data warehousing, you kind of have to know the questions your analysts are going to ask in advance. That's why you model. That's why you do data modeling, for example, for your warehouse. But in terms of AI, that's much more exploratory once again. So in this whole Hadoop movement that we've seen uh, unravel a bit in the last couple of years, uh, you had a really interesting concept called schema on read. So that means you just persist the data as it is, and then you apply the schema as you pull data out of the system. So that's nice because you don't have to worry about so much how you store the data or how you model the data. So data warehousing also was designed in the old days, right? And this is a topic we're gonna to talk about today, data access. How do you get access to the data? Well, 30 years ago, we had slow processors, expensive storage, right? we had uh, a situation where this stuff was really expensive to do. So only big companies could do data warehousing and the pipes were thin as well. So when the pipes are thin, the processors are slow and storage is expensive. Well, you have to be very lean about your data warehouse environment. You have to really think through how to model it, who's gonna get
get access to it, et cetera. Well, uh, it's a heavily engineered relational environment these days, of course, the, the data warehouse is, whereas, again, AI is a bit more open. And data warehousing is dominated by a handful of vendors. Now, there are some new ones. There are some really powerful new ones, like Snowflake, for example, cloud data warehousing. You've got Amazon with Redshift. Uh, whereas the AI market is just absolutely wide open. And then there's, of course, the structured query language, SQL. Those of you who track the industry remember that uh, for a while we had all these exciting NoSQL vendors, and we don't need SQL anymore. This is the new age. Well, a couple years after that, what did we have? A whole bunch of vendors talking about SQL on Hadoop. <laughs> We're going to do SQL on Hadoop. So obviously they figured out that uh, SQL is still pretty important. It is the lingua franca of data and databases. So this is a slide of a good buddy uh, of mine. I don't know him, obviously, but a wonderful, wonderful man, Carl Sagan. Many of you may remember, uh, he really opened my mind in lots of different ways by getting us to think about stuff, by being thought-provoking, quite literally. And I remember watching him one time talk about two-dimensional creatures and how, if, what it would be like in a two-dimensional world. And then he said, what if one day in your two-dimensional world, someone came along and picked up one of the two-dimensional creatures and held it up above in the third dimension? And I'll never forget how much that really struck me and got me thinking about keeping an open mind, about new perspectives, right? And this is what analysis will do for you. This is what data strategy will do for you. And it's really important. So again, we're talking about digital transformation. We're talking about automating processes in our businesses. But in order to do that efficiently, you really have to think things through because it's a whole different world out there now. You have cheap storage, you have fat pipes, you have really fast processors, you have, um, you have uh, GPUs and, uh, as well as CPUs, and of course GPUs, graphic processing units, are really good for parallel processing. So we can thank all the gamers out there for all the money that they spent on those Xboxes and all those other Nintendos and everything else, because that fueled innovation in the GPU space. And then about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, a handful of companies figured out, hey, these GPUs are really, really good for parallel processing. And guess what? That's really good for machine learning. It's really good for artificial intelligence. So keeping your mind open about how problems can be solved is really important these days. So and it's all about performance. This is actually a slide from uh, Wikipedia, as was the last one. Uh, this is a performance of Don Quixote. As many of you may know, he was the guy who chased windmills. He was a bit of an idealist. But really, if you get right down to it again, Performance is at the center of data modeling. It's at the center of systems design, of systems engineering. It's at the center of digital transformation. You're trying to improve the performance of your operations. And these days, what's really exciting and, and fascinating for me is that you cannot just streamline business processes. You can collapse business processes. What used to take days or weeks can now be done in minutes or hours. So this is really, really powerful stuff, and it changes how you think about things. And there are a whole bunch of new technologies out there that are really very powerful and compelling for being able to, again, optimize throughput, optimize processes, collapse business processes down to seconds sometimes when it used to be minutes, hours, or days. So where did AI really come from in this last iteration? Well, mostly it's because of Facebook and Google and these other really huge cloud-first companies. They have so much data, and that's the important thing with artificial intelligence. You need lots and lots of training data. These algorithms must be trained. They usually need people involved to train them, so there's a human element to the training of these algorithms. And uh, I heard an interesting stat from an expert in this field a couple years ago who said that really only about 2% of people are good at training algorithms, because you have to be very disciplined, you have to be very focused, if you give uh, an algorithm bad inputs, the algorithm doesn't work very well. So you may have seen there's that uh, fun little thing going around the web of blueberry muffins versus dogs and how a, a dog's face, a certain kind of dog, can look like a blueberry muffin. Well, if you are one of the, person, one of the people trying to train the algorithm and you get it wrong, well, you're feeding bad inputs into the algorithm and it's not going to work very well. So AI really does need to be trained. Now, there are some new, very cutting-edge ways to have algorithms basically go against other algorithms to train themselves. That's some of what you see in uh, these machines that can move around, the robots, and how, they, how they're able to do what they do. But really, these big giants are the ones who really pushed forward the whole AI movement. And of course, deep learning is just part. It's a subset of artificial intelligence. There's supervised and unsupervised 
deep learning is very powerful, but you really need to know how you're going to use this stuff. It's not just that you can kind of throw some challenge at a deep learning module and come back and, and get your answer. It doesn't quite work for that. And of course, these big guys have some ethical, interesting perspectives in terms of what they can do with your data, and that is going to be hashed out over the next couple of years. This is something I learned just recently. If you've seen this kind of a CAPTCHA, LinkedIn uses it a lot. A lot of different websites will use a CAPTCHA to try to get you to uh, determine if you're a real person and not a robot. Well, you'll say, it says select all squares with vehicles. If there are none, click skip so you can see the vehicle in the lower left-hand corner. That's actually a deep learning module being run by Google. When you work on this thing, you are actually feeding inputs into a deep learning module for self-driving cars. I learned that just a couple of weeks ago. I think that's fascinating. So it's a crowdsourced engine, basically input for an AI module where you are the, the person helping to train the model, which I think is pretty cool. So there's a lot of different kinds of AI. You've got knowledge processing, probabilistic AI, uh, traditional machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, and of course, natural language processing, which is really taken off these days and is very powerful. I mean, Siri isn't uh, perfect, but she's getting better by the day. And of course, some of these applications are so personalized that uh, the deep learning module can learn from you and really get to know who you are. And that's not new. So you have knowledge processing. Remember when IBM's Watson uh, has done so well on Jeopardy, right? Uh, but also, it's good for diagnoses and some other uh, use cases. There's probability. So this, again, is another IBM story with uh, Gary Kasparov, the former chess champion. And if you think about how AI is able to do this, really this is probabilistic. So because the engine can crunch so many numbers, it can literally go through all the potential permutations of moves by the opponent and just run through them all and figure out the best answer. So that's how it won. It's just able to compute every single last computation, every single last permutation of possible moves by the human, and it won. So there are neural networks too. This is good stuff, but again, uh, some of these guys don't work so well. So I've actually talked to a number of different companies. In fact, on one of our radio shows yesterday, we had some folks from Canada from a, a company called Darwin AI, and they use deep learning to explain deep learning. They literally have a deep learning module that will be leveraged against existing deep learning modules to help people understand how it actually got to its answer. So there's a, a, a recognition issue here where a neural network kept making mistakes, and they ultimately figured out that it's because all the, the military vehicles were wet in the videos that were used for training. So remember the importance of training data. Well, if they're all wet, um, then all of a sudden it's, it's going to think that a civilian car that's wet is a military target. Well, we don't want that. So when you use these technologies, you really do have to be very careful about the end result, and you have to watch, is the algorithm getting it right or not? And if it's not, you have to keep training it until it does get it right. And there are some edge cases. So there's Lucille Ball, if some of you uh, who are a bit older or like old TV shows, remember you've got some explaining to do. So some of these deep learning modules are black boxes. And if they're doing things that are in regulated industries, like loan approvals, for example, you're going to want to make sure that you can explain how it got to that answer. Why did Bob get his loan turned down? Why did Susie get her loan approved? You better be able to explain that. That's one really interesting angle of AI. And of course, natural language processing. This is getting better and better by the day, and it's really getting to the point where it's pretty darn good. And you can actually watch on your iPhone or on your Samsung, when you speak into the phone, you'll see the words come out, and then you'll actually see edits that occur. And that's because there's a real-time engine there kind of absorbing what you're saying and changing its mind, if you will, about what you've actually just said. So this stuff is getting really, really powerful. But there are some downsides. You remember this whole comment about re reproducibility. Here's our buddy, uh, she blinded me with science, Howard Jones, I love that song. Again, science is a discipline underpinned by a methodology. Science itself is not an infallible representation of reality. So there are some issues with uh, <laughs> with data science today, and I think it's part and parcel to the excitement around predictive analytics and these deeper um, algorithms which are being described as data science. But really data science, I would say, is the assiduous management of data from 
source to target, if you will, for the entire life cycle of a data management practice, from collecting the data to enriching the data to normalizing the data to leveraging the data, analyzing the data, operationalizing the data. That whole process really needs to be pinned down and understood, and then it must be reproducible. I was at an event where some folks were talking about the reproducibility problem in science, which is nonsense, because if it's not reproducible, it's not science. Okay, this is actually re requisite for scientific process. It must be reproducible. So my last slide here, I'll just kind of talk a little bit more. Again, we're talking about data. We're talking about digital transformation. We're talking about access to data. This is the Kraken <laughs> right here. I love the Kraken. For any of you who saw that movie years and years ago, release the Kraken. And there was a remake fairly recently. Well, in many ways, AI is like the Kraken. There's even an AI module, an AI tool technology called the Kraken by a company called Big Squid out of Utah, which is a pretty interesting tech. But the reason I say it's like the Kraken is because it's going to go at everything you give it access to. So if you're trying to use AI to find the interesting patterns in your business, to find optimizations, to find ways to efficiently digitally transform, remember, you need to be careful about what data you give it access to because it's just going to suck up everything in its path. And it's going to make some decisions based on that data. So if you give it data it should not have access to, you're going to have some problems. And this is something to be very, very careful about. So it is very powerful technology. There's no doubt about that. But you got to watch out and be very careful in how you apply these technologies as you move forward in your journey of digital transformation. And so now I'm going to try to hand this over to Jeff. Give me one more second here. Change presenter, yes. Yeah. Okay, Jeff Bainton, I'm handing it off to you from Magnitude All right. Technology. Tell us a bit about what you folks are doing to enable efficient digital transformation. Thank you, Eric. And I think that I've got my screen up. Uh, so definitely some, some very exciting points that you had there about AI and the changes that are going to come with that. Um, you touched on a few different topics from AI to data warehousing. And even if you wanna take a look at different items like reporting or analysis, um, one thing that has changed massively over the last decade is just the data landscape that is out there, how we access that data, and not just the raw access, but actually the processes around that access and making that more efficient. So that's the type of thing that I'm gonna get into. Um, just a second, let me get my mouse on the right part for my presentation, there we go. So yeah, like I was saying, uh, first talk about the modern data landscape and some of the complexities involved there, and talk about how Simba has been developing solutions to manage this much easier both for enterprises as well as software companies that are building data applications, and some of the benefits generally as well as specific use cases for both of those parties. So the modern data landscape is a massively fragmented data landscape. It's not just those SQL relational databases that Eric was talking about earlier. Um, we've got Hadoop, we've got NoSQL, we've got social media, SaaS applications, and all of these have very different ways of managing data, and it's important for companies to interact with all of these types of data sources in this day and age. To give a specific example of this, in the marketing vertical, there's been a huge explosion in technology for marketing in the last decade. Looking from 2011, around 150 sources were discovered in the survey, to this year, over 7,000. Uh, this is a survey done by Chief Martech of the technology landscape for marketing every year. And this year they had to stop at 7,000 because there was just too many and it wasn't worth the resources to find them all anymore. These aren't all necessarily data sources, but it shows you the huge explosion in technology. Many of you have probably heard of DB engines. They rank different uh, databases in terms of popularity, both as a whole, but also in different segments of the data world. And there's been a huge increase in the databases that they are ranking from 154 back in 2013 to about 350 this year. Again, looking at some DB Engine's data, 
the different data models that databases are using. There's a huge number of different data models, and this makes it very confusing and very complex for people who need to interact with all these types of databases. It's not just rows and columns anymore. There's nested objects, there's nested arrays, key value stores, graphs, all these other sorts of things. And this adds a lot of complexity to dealing with data. Add to that, if you look at each segment, and there are a large number of different players in many of these segments, and each of them do things differently, adding even more complexity. Now, it's not only important how many data sources there are out there. What really matters to the individual at the end of the day is how does this impact me? And so looking at businesses and how they make decisions, this is some data on how many data sources businesses look to to make decisions. So over on the right hand side there, you'll see that there are a decent chunk of businesses using less than five data sources, both internal and external to make decisions, but they're still probably using multiple data sources and actually a pretty substantial amount uh, are using at least five sources to make their decisions. And again, looking on the left hand side, we can see that for marketers, they're juggling quite a large amount of data sources, uh, getting up to 16 different data sources that they need to keep track of. And again, many secondary second party data sources, so external data sources that they have to use. And they need to find ways to manage all of this access to data, to rationalize this data into some unified schema so that they can make sense of it, so that they can actually take action from that data. And so just to touch on some of the complications, again, um, all of these data sources have different types of APIs. They're not just SQL databases. Some of them have REST APIs. Some of them have SOAP APIs. Uh, some of them just have completely their own bespoke APIs. They have different query languages. Some of them are SQL-like query languages. Some aren't. Different ways to represent data types. Different ways even to do something simple like list all of the tables or whatever is the, the analog of a table in their system to list the columns or the attributes of those objects to actually get results. And again, as I mentioned, different data models. And so this can make getting any real data out of this, out of these systems very complicated, but there is a way to simplify that. And that is something that Simba has been working with for a long time. Earlier, Eric called SQL the lingua franca of data. And I would definitely echo that sentiment. Most of you have probably worked with SQL before. Um, most people who work with data on a regular basis do, even if they don't know it, because most of the applications, whether it's Tableau or Excel or Informatica, are using SQL under the covers to interact with the databases that they are getting that data from. And ODBC and JDBC are great delivery mechanisms, uh, standardized ways to interact with databases and to leverage that SQL. Simba has been working in ODBC since the initial specification came out from Microsoft in the early 90s. And we have developed a lot of expertise and many really great relationships since that standpoint or since that starting point. We've developed our own SDK and initially we use that SDK to help other companies build the connectors that they gave to their customers. So people like Vertica uh, is a good example of that. But we've also started developing our own off the shelf drivers and I shouldn't say starting, we started. Uh, we are well along that right now and we have a very large catalog of drivers in all different data areas. And we've got great engineering relationships with some of the biggest data companies out there. Um, Eric talked about Snowflake and Amazon Redshift as cloud data warehousing solutions, and we help them with their ODBC drivers. We are also very involved in the Hadoop space and provide the Spark and Hive and Impala drivers for all of the major Hadoop vendors. We have great engineering to engineering relationships with these companies, and even though they are very capable software companies, they recognize that it makes more sense to have Simba build their connectivity than it does to do it themselves because we have this expertise and they want to focus on their core offering. Now I mentioned at the start a couple different use cases and one of the use cases we see is to help other software companies with their lifecycle management for data connectivity. 
applications, whether they are analysis tools or whether they're data cleansing or ETL, need access to a whole bunch of data sources. It's very expensive to build all of this connectivity. And not only that, but it takes a lot of time and effort to maintain. A lot of these data sources or SaaS applications are iterating quite quickly on their APIs. And so you need to keep up to date with all of those. You need to do new releases to keep up to date um, software, or sorry, security updates, things like this also are important things to make sure that you're keeping up with. And most engineering companies have limited resources, so this is a challenge to actually keep up with that. And if they bundle a lot of connectors, that can end up being a huge amount of work and can turn into fire drills. If there's an important API update or an important security patch that happened, after someone released their product, most of the time these connectors are bundled right into the product. So to do a new release of a specific connector, you have to actually do a new release of the whole product. This results into a whole bunch of work just to fix one connector. And this can result in many fire drills a year if you're connecting to 20, 30, even you know, 50 or 60 data sources. That's a huge amount of work to do those fire drills. Magnitude Gateway can help decouple these bundled connectors from the actual application. If you look over on the right, there are two main sections of Magnitude Gateway. There's the Gateway Client, which has a universal ODBC or JDBC driver, depending on what the application needs, which connects to a Gateway server. So it's a two-tiered architecture, and the universal ODBC or JDBC driver is very stable. It's built on Simba's client server protocol, which has been around for quite a long time and is very stable and does not need significant updates or frequent updates. The gateway server hosts the standard adapters that you see there, and those are the parts that connect to the actual data sources, whether it's Oracle, Salesforce, Mongo, or Spark. And so these are the parts that are gonna need to get updated as those APIs update for those security patches, this sort of thing. But the application can bundle that single point of contact in there, the universal ODBC driver, and they don't need to worry about those updates. They can rev their product on their cycle and not be having to do it on the connectivity cycle because the end user can do that independently in the gateway server. So just to reiterate some of the benefits here, um, and actually mention a few new ones, reduced time to market is a huge one for app companies building new applications. It takes a long time to build widespread connectivity, but if you can just build against a single interface, whether it's ODBC or JDBC and SQL, it's a lot easier. You can plug in a whole bunch of adapters on the gateway server and get to market much faster. This also shrinks your development and maintenance costs because you don't have to maintain all of that connectivity, which is a very large burden, also in testing and infrastructure. For expanding your target market, your product might start with connections to maybe two or three target uh, key applications. However, there are many other applications that are similar. Uh, so whether it's other marketing SaaS applications, whether it's other relational databases, if you can connect to more of those, you have a lot more prospects that you can go after to try and sell your product. As I mentioned earlier, most engineering companies are constrained for resources, so this really just lets you focus on your core propositions, your core values, and someone else can worry about that data access. Simba's built up a lot of expertise and a lot of great relationships and is a great company to help you do that. Now, going back to the enterprise use case, and just to bring back to the front of your mind, there's just a huge number of databases out there, each with different complexities, different data models. And then there's this whole world of SaaS applications, social media, and other cloud type applications that host a whole bunch of really valuable enterprise data. And this is, of course, just a very small sampling of that. So if you've got a single application like Tableau and you're trying to connect to maybe Oracle, that's pretty straightforward. 
even if you're trying to connect a single application to a whole bunch of different data sources, reasonably straightforward, not that hard to deal with. If you have a bunch of applications and you're trying to connect all of these applications to different data sources in your company, different users might need different data sources, might be comfortable with different applications, you get a much larger connectivity problem and you end up with hundreds or maybe even thousands of installations of connectors across your company. And what does this look like for a small enterprise? Imagine if a company had 20 analysts, each with de desktop installations of connectors, plus five server environments, so 25 total environments. There's a total of 10 different data sources this company's really concerned with, and each of the connectors they install needs to be updated four times per year. That's gonna add up to 125 initial driver installations, and if that's four updates a year per driver, we're getting up to 500 updates a year. So that's gonna be a pretty significant burden on this IT department for that company. Now, if it's a larger organization with 250 environments that need all these connectors, that explodes. We're getting up to 5,000 updates a year. And if we translate this into time and look at 15 minutes for an update, that adds up to a huge, huge number of IT hours and days that are being spent on these updates. If the company was using Magnitude Gateway, they would be able to reduce this dramatically. The install would still be about the same. There'd still be 250 initial installations, but it would be a lot easier after that. The updates are centralized now to the Gateway server. So on the client side, the individual user's machine sides, there's only that one universal ODBC or JDBC connector, which is very stable. On the server side, there are only those 10 adapters that are necessary now. You don't need to duplicate all those drivers or connectors on every end user's machine. So that's only 40 updates a year instead of 5,000. So we're saving 155 days of IT resources on this which is either letting them focus on much more important issues or potentially even reducing the, the need for some of these IT headcount. To give this a bit of a picture, this is the same scenario. And so you've got a whole bunch of different applications from Excel to Informatica, maybe some data scientists using RStudio and some folks using Tableau. And instead of needing to worry about what connectors come with these products, where do I find the connectors for different data sources, Magnitude Gateway can get you connected to all of the major databases, uh, the most important SaaS applications, NoSQL sources, social media, and makes it really easy to interact with those. And so you just install the universal driver on every end user's machine that connects into the Magnitude Gateway platform in the middle there using the universal ODBC or JDBC driver. And those adapters end up connecting out to the different actual data sources. And so this is gonna have really large benefits, especially to the IT department at different companies. They don't need to spend all this time managing this for users doing the installations, doing the updates on behalf of users or making sure that users are doing this. For users, it really relieves them of a big headache because before they might have to rely on IT, this is gonna slow them down. Now they don't need to worry about it. They can just quickly get access to the data they need on whatever environment they need that in. It also makes it really easy to roll out access to a new data source. If your company starts using Marketo, for example, and your analysts need quick access, you can just install the Marketo adapter on the gateway server, and instantly all of the gateway client environments are able to access and interact with that data source. Um, IT could also independently set up the configurations once on the gateway server, and then the end users can access those in their own individual environments right away, so you don't need to configure this connectivity in multiple places. And we'll touch on this in more detail in a minute, but it definitely enhances the overall enterprise security. It gives a lot stronger ability to keep everything up to date and organized, 
and there are many other security features built into Gateway. Security is important for any enterprise and we have taken that into strong account for Gateway. There is strong encryption between the ODBC and JDBC clients and the Gateway server, making sure that your data is safe as it's transiting there. We also support and enforce the authentication mechanisms that the actual data source requires, whether that's Kerberos or different uh, you know, SSL, whatever authentication mechanisms they are looking at, those are enforced and that security is not bypassed in any way. No data is stored in the ODBC or JDBC client side and the database data is not stored in gateway at all, it's just transiting through. There is configuration data that is stored for the actual connections to the data sources. That is in the centralized gateway server and it's strongly encrypted and protected. The centralized configuration management I touched on a minute ago. This means that you don't need a whole bunch of duplication of user authentication data on different machines. Users might be keeping that in notepad files. Um, who knows how different applications store that, whether they do it in a secure manner or not. If you can store that in the centralized gateway settings application, you can be sure that it's secure and that your users have the easy access they need to it when they need to connect to a data source. This also makes it really easy for IT to set up an environment for the end users so that the end users can connect on any system and don't have to continually go back and ask for additional updates. And when they do change their password or the server IP address changes or something like this, it's really easy, just change it in one place and everyone is good to go. Another thing that we really focused on this is usability. ODBC and JDBC aren't the most user-friendly of protocols. If you look at Windows, there are some lovely Win32 dialogues. I'll give you an example in just a minute. Um, lots to improve on there. On the Linux side of things, there's no user interface. It's all configuration files. JDBC, again, no user interface. It's a connection string, so left up to the application on how they want to enable users there. Gateway makes this a lot easier. So this is the Postgres, the open source Postgres driver and the configuration, part of the configuration dialogues that go with it, very dated, doesn't look very nice for our sensibilities today. Um, if we look on the left, you know, not too bad, easy enough to, to see what data they're looking for. But once we get into these options, it becomes a bit of a rat's nest for trying to figure out what is necessary in each of these sections. It's really difficult to understand what some of them are, and it's gonna be hard for an end user to figure this out on their own in many cases. Um, they're probably gonna spend a lot of time trying to reference documentation and find even what they're looking for in the documentation. They're probably gonna to have to go to the IT department, which is gonna be a headache for the end user and for the IT department. We have modernized the user interface, and so you don't need to rely on those ODBC dialogues anymore or for that matter, the configuration files on Linux or the connection strings for JDBC. It's a nice modern UI. There are hints underneath the different fields. So username probably doesn't need a hint, but something like security token, nice to have a hint so that the user understands the context for it, maybe doesn't need to go to the documentation. We'll also be able to link directly to the documentation because this is a web UI making it really easy for the user to figure out what they're looking for. And you'll also notice that there's a nice tabbed display up here. And so it's really easy to see what categories of things you're probably gonna need to configure as an end user and to find the specific configuration options that you're looking for. And just to give you a look at one of the other tabs, you just the type of information that you would expect on a proxy tab and really easy to get this configured and set up. Another component that we are adding to Gateway is intelligent adapters. And this is focused on making it really simple for business users to get actionable data from complex systems. Business users 
might not be that comfortable doing joins across multiple tables or doing a whole bunch of filtering or aggregation or things like this. These work with data systems like Salesforce or Oracle eBusiness Suite are the initial two um, and are designed to answer specific questions, KPI type questions, for example, so that you can select these views or tables from a catalog of views. They appear transparent to the application. They're just a separate schema in the ODBC or JDBC driver. And you know you can do some, some basic filtering or things like this on top of them, but all the heavy lifting has really been done for you. So this bit over on the right is the SQL that is behind one of these views. And don't worry about the details, but it's pretty ugly and it's not something that a business user is going to want to handle on their own. Uh, if you take a simple example from Salesforce, we have a view called Sales Representative Metrics, and it does something like what you expect it to. It gives information for a small for a sales team, uh, gives you information like how many opportunities they have open this quarter, what their close rate is this quarter, how many they've closed lost, how much revenue they've brought in, and how much revenue is outstand, outstanding, for example. And so if the user were to have to configure that themselves, it would be five or six different joins depending on their specific Salesforce configuration and would be a whole bunch of other processing on top of that. These views are also pretty, pretty solid. They're configured based on the individual user's permission and they take into account the organization's configuration in the application. So whether things like multi-currency are enabled, for example. So those are the main benefits that I wanted to go through for Gateway. Um, really just about managing access to data. We have been working a long time at Simba for that basic data connectivity and SQL on top of any source. And just with the explosion of connectors that we ourselves have, plus the data sources that we know enterprises need to access to be able to make their decisions, we've seen a lot of ways that we could further improve that data access, further improve the processes around that data access, making sure that companies, whether enterprise or whether software applications, can effectively manage that data access and not have to worry about it themselves, uh, just take that whole burden off of them and make it really easy to get connected to the data that people need to make their decisions. And here is some contact information. Uh, we invite you to try the free evaluation of Gateway or of any of our drivers from Simba.com. We will be releasing Gateway Embedded in the next couple weeks, uh, the exact date to be determined. But Gateway Embedded is the specific version of Gateway targeted at data applications to embed in their product. Uh, has white labeling and a whole bunch of other functionality like that. Uh, and definitely a great thanks to Eric and Techopedia. Yeah, and we've got some good questions here too, folks, and don't be shy. Feel free to send your question either through the questions console or there's a chat window as well that you can use to send in the questions. And you know, I thought you did a good job explaining and articulating the, the diversity of the landscape out there these days. I mean, I often talk about the MarTech, well, it was 5,000, now it's 7,000. Just eight or nine years ago, it was like 250. So that's a, a perfect indication of just how that space is exploding. And there's so much data everywhere, and there's so many different interesting ways to structure the data in those systems, right? So that, I think, speaks to the importance of having some foundational abstraction layer you can use to manage that environment, right? And that's the whole vision of Gateway, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, just, just a whole lot of complexity out there and make this a simple way so that you don't have to learn the intricacies of every data system. If you're an analyst that just needs some access to data, you can just plug it in and get on with your job. Yep. And what about some of the newer uh, drivers? For example, I do a lot of work with SAP, and SAP HANA is a very powerful and new architecture for business, right? So uh, they've gone fully in memory with HANA, it's a database, but they also, of course, have um, S4 HANA, the new ERP, which is all in memory. 
What about accessing that? Can can uh, Gateway access SAP HANA? So HANA is something that is on Simba's roadmap right now for our own individual driver, but SAP themselves has already released a HANA driver, and we don't want to limit the management powers of Gateway just to the drivers that Simba has. Uh, there's going to be different instances where the vendor has a driver you're going to want to use or, or something like this. Um, you'll be able to plug those ODBC drivers into Gateway itself to still get all the management benefits of not needing to install it on every end user's machine, uh, of being able to do these updates more efficiently, and still get that access to the data. Yeah, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head there with one of the key value propositions here is that if you take this approach, when there needs to be an update somewhere, you update it once and that populates across the environment for all of the users. I mean, in a way, that's that's kind of like the value of cloud, too, right? Instead of having to focus on every single machine across the enterprise, which, as I'm sure our audience knows, was just a Herculean task, now you've resolved that at one critical point, and it populates across the environment, right? Yep, that is exactly it. Yeah, that, I mean, for those who are not in the, the sort of IT space, for those who are not DBAs, for those who are just the business analysts, you know, clamoring for more data, that may not seem like a big deal, but you had that one great slide, I don't know if you could pull it up again, where you talked about the hours and the days when you multiply out over the course of the year, well, guess what, that really does add up to a tremendous amount of time and effort, and you know, it actually hits on one of my other common themes, I really need to write something about this, but it improves morale. In the organization, here it is: 4,960 updates, 155 days. Oh no, that's almost half a year. It's basically half a year if you just factor in weekends, right? So, what do you think about the morale factor that you have IT folks now kind of sharpening their pencils and focused on more interesting, meaty problems? And that's what really good IT people want to do. They don't want to do boring, rote. Oh, this dialogue box, that dialogue box, that's not what gets an IT person excited, right? What do you think about the boost to morale that will result from taking this kind of approach? Yep, I definitely agree. It uh, takes away drudgery from the IT folks of not having to focus so much time on these menial tasks and be able to actually make meaningful changes for their enterprises, do some of that tech debt maybe that they haven't been able to do because they keep getting sidelined on these type of things. Not only the morale for IT though, it's really gonna improve things for the end users because it's really frustrating for the end user when they can't do it themselves and they have to go to IT and maybe it takes IT a few days or a week or something like that because they've got other priorities than this. Uh, so it's gonna not only improve IT's morale, but it's really gonna save the end users a lot of headache and hassle. Well, you know the other really cool thing too is that you're enabling a much more fluid environment of interactivity between IT and the business because kind of to your point, the business will run into a hurdle of some kind, they they launch a ticket to IT or they put in a request. The longer that takes to bring to fruition, the less energy that remains for the initial design idea or whatever the business person was trying to do. So my point is that when you collapse that process, that's what we talked about at the top of the hour, right? Not just streamlining processes, but collapsing them to where they go from hours to seconds to, to zero sometimes, like as we discussed with populating across the environment. When you collapse those cycle times, now the users are much more engaged and they're much more willing to share new ideas and try out new plans or whatever the case may be. And that is critical for digital transformation, right? If you are the business person or the IT person and you see an opportunity, you realize, hey, if we could just take this approach instead of that approach, we're going to solve these four problems and everything's going to move faster, customers will be happier, et cetera. That kind of dynamic is really fostered by this kind of environment, right? Definitely. And even if you just look at the rate of change of data, and it's so fast these days um, that businesses need to be able to make decisions or the data is not even relevant anymore. So if you are bottlenecked and having to be delayed by days or weeks, um, that's really gonna impact your ability to make those appropriate decisions. 
Yeah, let's talk about changes in data sources too. So you you threw up the Martech 7000. Obviously, it would take a lot of time to write connectors to, to all 7000, but I'm sure there are some similarities between various ones. And if a company has a particular need for a connector to a particular solution, I'm sure you've, you're kind of like halfway there probably or more. But can you talk about how Simba stays on top of this really fluid and changing environment? How often do these data sources change in terms of, of what you have to do to connect to them? How is that whole process managed? Yeah, so it depends a lot on the data source. Um, things like Salesforce, for example, they have a pretty stable three times a year that they update their APIs. Um, so we make sure to, to keep on top of what's changing there and keep up with their latest updates. Something like Presto uh, has been iterating very quickly and so has you know probably in the low dozens of updates a year. So being able to keep on top of that uh, we work very closely with Starburst Data, who spun out of Teradata Presto, to make sure that we are keeping up with the latest changes in Presto. We also do a lot of work to build up frameworks for us to make it easy to access these different types of data sources so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, uh, making it a lot quicker for us to come out with new connectors or to adapt to changes in these data systems and APIs. Uh, so if you look at things like NoSQL, there are a lot of similar concepts in how that works. Even if the APIs are different, the nitty gritty of some of the data models might be a little bit different, uh, but we, we have internal frameworks that help us to adapt and build new connectors. Same with REST APIs or other things like this. There are a lot of differences between REST APIs in how they do pagination or how you pass filters down to the REST API. Uh, but we've built a very large number of connectors to REST APIs, so we've been able to abstract that and, and really help make that process more efficient. Yeah, and that's the key, right? Abstraction. I mean, again, let's get back to digital transformation. You're automating processes. That's what you want to do, and you want to ideally automate as far upstream as possible. And that's what I love about this solution is that talk about upstream, you are at the core of data access. And that is what can fuel all these different applications, all these different processes, all these different transformations. Data is the key to everything, right? I mean, I'm a BI data warehousing analytics guy, so I get excited about that side of the house. But none of that stuff matters unless you infuse it into your operations, unless you change something about how your business actually ticks day in and day out. And to me, what you've done is very impressive because, again, it's all the way upstream. So the, the work that you do at the foundation is going to benefit every last little tentacle of the Kraken, right? Definitely. Always good to get more Kraken references in there. Um, <laughs> That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly it. Um, just make that data available acro across the whole enterprise, make it easy for the end users, um, and just have that one source that, that everyone can go to to get access to the data sources they need. Yeah, this is really impressive stuff. It really, it's very exciting to me to think again, because the, the other side of the equation here is why. We didn't talk too much about the drivers, but there is the, the so-called Amazon effect, right? And we've seen this now in several industries, and you can see it on your television even. There are commercials for Tackle, for example. I've seen these commercials for Tackle, which is basically creating an engine now, a web engine, that will facilitate the interaction of clients and service providers for things like taking out the trash and cleaning your house and doing all these other little tidbits. Well, for the folks who get on, on top of that wave and ride it, that's a very powerful tool. But for anyone who is in the business of trying to do that themselves, you're just going to have to adapt to the environment. I mean, I think that's the, the reality on the ground with digital transformation at scale in the information economy is that businesses really need to keep their eyes to the horizon and keep their ears to the ground to understand what's changing and how it's changing and to be able to leverage that. Just think of third-party data or alternative data as it's sometimes called. Um, being able to identify opportunities to use alternative data, this is a huge 
development in the retail space and the marketing space where companies are selling access to data sets that are coming from transactional systems at scale to where you can optimize your supply chain, for example. Maybe you're a, a clothing retailer and you can get data that says, hey, guess what? In your market, people really like the color purple. So we would recommend that you go out and buy a bunch of purple stuff to sell to your customers because that's what they want. And that's just one example of how the information economy is presenting these new opportunities. And if you're not able to adapt to that, if you're not able to leverage these kinds of information sources, you're just going to get behind the wheel, right behind the eight ball. What do you think about that, Jeff? Yep, I agree. Um, and that's that's part of the beauty of this is the modularity and the adaptability that's built into it. So if there are new data systems that crop up that you need access to or external data systems that you haven't used before, how do you integrate those into your reporting, um, into your data, data scientists and your analysis? Do you continually build one-off bespoke solutions to resolve this? If you can build that one ODBC driver or Simba can build that one ODBC driver, plug it into Gateway and give everyone access, that is a whole heck of a lot easier on your organization than having to do workarounds or manual processes to integrate these new systems. And it can really just streamline how you access data regardless of where that data is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that too because I wanted to point out that long-standing rule we've had that data scientists spend 80% of their time in data management trying to clean the data, trying to move the data around and you threw out that comment about bespoke one-offs, basically, which is the tendency, right? I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. In the business world, people tend to be impatient, and if they can't get what they want, if they can't get the data source they want, what do they do? They go off the, off the beaten path, and they just take care of it in some sort of bespoke offline way. Well, that's not transparent. That's not governable. Um, it's very difficult to change. You know, one of my uh, favorite uh, consultants in the space, a guy named Rick Sherman, always talks about this. He goes, yeah, that custom coding, it's fine for small little fixes and solutions, but as soon as something starts to scale, you're in big trouble. And so again, people have to recognize the importance of going upstream as far upstream as you can. And I think this is one of the most clever solutions I've seen for being able to enable that because the bottom line is the business wants what it wants. And if IT can't deliver that, they're going to find some other way to do it, right? Yep, definitely agree. And, and this definitely makes it a, a process that you can easily implement across the organization to get that access so that folks aren't having to go and, and do those little custom things that no one else in the company really understands. Uh, just one, one right way for everyone to be able to interact with the data. Yeah, that's right one right way to do it. So in closing, we only got about a minute or so left here. Um, we'll maybe throw up your slide of uh, contact information again. Who, who winds up purchasing this at companies? Is it traditionally the IT department? Is it like a chief data officer? Who is the person who winds up really getting it and pulling the trigger to make this happen? Yeah, so definitely chief data officer, um, manager of IT uh, oftentimes comes into because a lot of times it's IT that people are going to. Um, if it's a software company, it's going to be product management is quite often the person that uh, has that need for the product. But, but definitely chief data officer, chief information officer at the enterprise are two of the common roles that we see uh, this ultimately boiling up to. Yeah, that's important stuff. So listen, folks, thank you very much for your time and attention. Big thanks to our friends from Techopedia for uh, getting all the hardware and software and, uh, and all the promotions they did to get you all here. As you've heard in this conversation, this is really foundational, cool innovation. I think this is one of the most clever uh, approaches I've seen to solving a huge part of the data challenge. Because if you can't get to the data, you can't use the data. It's really that simple. And I think these folks have done a great job. So thanks once again to all of you. Thanks to the folks at, at Magnitude for their time and attention. Of course, Jeff Bainton, thanks for you uh, joining our conversation today and really shedding some interesting light on what's going on out there. And with that, we will bid you farewell, folks. We do archive all these webinars. You should be able to get it later on, if not today, then sometime tomorrow. And other than that, we hope to see you next time. Thanks again.